Oh, so you wanted to read a book too, huh? Well, I guess you can read of me then. Anyway, you might be able to help. Well, after I gave Yuri one of my comic books and some of my manga to read, well, she gave me one of these books that she likes and... Well, I don't really like these kind of books, but I don't want to hurt her feelings, so... I guess I'll give it a go. Anyway, you might be able to help me out a bit with reading it. What is it? Uh, can you not read the title? It says it's Scottish fairy tales or something like that. I don't know how many are in it. Fine, let me check. Okay, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Twenty-four different stories? <laughs> she must be crazy if she thinks I'm gonna read these all at once. Ah, so many words. You wanna know what ones are in it? <sighs> Fine. Alright, there's Thomas the Rhymer, Gold Tree and Silver Tree, Wibbity Story, Thread Eaten, the Seal Catcher and the Merman, The Page Boy and the Silver Goblet, The Black Bull of Norway, The Wee Bannock, The Elven Knight, What to Say to the New Moon, Harp Trot the Spindress, Nibbity Fit and Clippity Fit, what, what are these names? The Fairies of Merlin Crag, The Winning of Robin Redbreast and Jenny Wren, Dwarf Stone, Kenobi Dick and Thomas of Ercl- Ugh, I don't even care. The Lard of Cole, Pussy Barons, The Milk White Dew, The Draglin Hogley, I don't- The Witch of Fife, Brownie of I don't even- Jeez, I knew you really liked hard-worded books, but this really takes the cookie. Here, let's... I don't know, uh... Hmm. The seal catcher and the merman sounds at least interesting, so, uh... Why don't we try that, huh? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, let me just get to it. Um, uh, let me just get comfy here so I can, uh, 
read this. What, you thought I wasn't gonna read it? Of course I am. Um, hold on. Ah, there we go. Much comfier. Well, you're gonna have to put up with me reading it, okay? <laughs> Good. <clears throat> Don't make fun of me if I get anything wrong. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a man who lived not very far from John O'Groat's house, which as everyone knows, is in the very north of Scotland. He lived in a little cottage by the seashore, and made his living by catching seals and selling their fur, which is very valuable. <sighs> this is so boring already. <sighs> he earned a good deal of money in this way, those creatures used to come out of the sea in large numbers and lie on the rocks near his house, basking in the sunshine, so that it was not difficult to creep up behind them and kill them. Well, he seems pretty dickish. Some of those seals were larger than others, and the country people used to call them Rowane and whisper that they were not seals at all but mermen and merwomen who came from a country of their own, far down under the ocean, who assumed the strange disguise in order that they might pass through the water and come up to breathe the air of this earth of ours. Why would you be so dumb? But the seal catcher only laughed at them and said that their seals were most worth killing, for their skins were so big that he got extra price for them. Now only- uh, Don't make fun of me, okay? Uh, let me try that again. Now it chanced one day when he was pursuing his calling that he stabbed a seal with his hunting knife, and whether the stroke had not been sure enough or not, I cannot say with a loud cry of pain, the creature slipped off the rock into the sea and disappeared under the water, carrying the knife along with it. The seal catcher, much annoyed at his clumsiness, and also at the loss of his knife, went home to dinner in a very downcast frame of mind. <laughs> Serves him right. On his way, he met a horseman who was so tall and so strange looking and who rode on such a gigantic horse that he stopped and looked at him in astonishment, wondering who he was and from what country he came. The stranger stopped also and asked him his trade, and on hearing that he was a seal catcher, he immediately ordered a great number of seal skins. The seal catcher was delighted, for such an order meant a large sum of money to him. But his face fell when the horseman added that it was absolutely necessary that the skin should be delivered that evening. I cannot do it, he said in a disappointed voice, for the seals will not come back to the rocks again until tomorrow morning. I can take you to a place where there are any number of seals, answered the stranger, if you will mount behind me on my horse and come with me. Well, that seems like a really dumb idea. The seal catcher agreed to this, and climbed up behind the rider, who shook his bridle rein, and off the great horse galloped at such a pace that he had much ado to keep his seat. On and on they went, flying like the wind, until at last they came to the edge of a huge cliff, the face of which went sheer down to the sea. Here, the mysterious horseman pulled up his steed with a jerk. Get off now, he said shortly. The seal catcher did as he was bid, and when he found himself safe on the ground, 
and peeped cautiously over the edge of the cliff to see if there... Uh, hold on, I need to turn the page. Were any seals lying on the rocks below? To his astonishment, he saw no rocks, only the blue sea, which came right up to the foot of the cliff. Where are the seals that you spoke of? He asked anxiously, wishing that he had never set out on such a rash adventure. You will see presently, answered the stranger, who was attending to his horse's bridle. Seal catcher was now fairly frightened, for he felt sure that some evil was about to befall him, and in such a lovely place, he knew that it would be useless to cry out for help. It would serve him right. And it seemed as if his fears would prove only too true, for the next moment the stranger's hand was laid upon his shoulder, and he felt himself being hurled bodily over the cliff, and then he fell with a splash into the sea. He thought that his last hour had come, and he wondered how anyone could work such a deed of wrong upon an innocent man. But, to his astonishment, he found that some change must have passed over him, for instead of being choked by the water, he could breathe quite easily, and he and his companion, who was still close at his side, seemed to be sinking as quickly down for the sea as they had flown for the air. Down and down they went, nobody knows how far, till at least they came to a huge arched door, which appeared to be made of pink coral, strutted over with cockle shells. Huh, this is actually kind of interesting. It opened of its own accord, and when they entered they found themselves in a huge hall the walls of which were formed of mother of pearl, and the floor of which was a sea sand smooth and firm and yellow. The hall was crowded with occupants, but they were seals, not men, and when the seal catcher turned his companion to ask him what it all meant, he was aghast to find that he too had assumed the form of a seal. He was still more aghast when he caught sight of himself in a large mirror that hung on the wall, and saw that he also no longer bore the likeness of a man, but was transformed into a nice, hairy brown seal. Oh, woe is it to me, he said to himself, for no fault of mine, own oh, this artful stranger had laid some baneful charm upon me, and in this awful guise will I remain for the rest of my natural life. Oh, I hate it when people talk like this. It's so confusing. At first, none of the huge creatures spoke to him. For some reason or other, they seemed to be very sad and moved gently about the hall, talking quietly and mournfully to one another, or laid sadly upon the sandy floor, wiping big tears from their eyes with their soft, furry fins. But presently, they began to notice him and to whisper to one another, and presently his guide moved away from him and disappeared for a door at the end of the hall. When he returned, he held a huge knife in his hand. Didst thou ever see this before? He asked, holding it out to the unfortunate seal catcher, who, to his horror, recognized his own hunting knife with which he had struck the seal in the morning, and which had been carried off by the wounded animal. At the sight of it, he fell upon his face and begged for mercy, for he at once came to the conclusion that the inhabitants of the cavern, enraged at the harm which had been wrought upon their comrade, had in some magic way contrived to capture him, and to... bring him down to their subterranean abode in order to wreak their vengeance upon him by killing him. But instead of doing so, they crowded round him, 
rubbing their soft noses against his fur to show their sympathy and implored him not to put himself about, for no harm would befall him, and they would love him all their long lives if he would only do what they asked him. Tell me what it is, said the seal catcher, and I will do it if it lies within my power. Follow me, answered his guide, and he led the way to the door through which he had disappeared when he went to seek the knife. The seal catcher followed him, and there in a smaller room he found a great brown seal lying on a bed of pale pink seaweed with a gaping wound in his side. This is my father said his guide, whom thou wounded this morning, thinking that he was one of the common seals who live in the sea, instead of a merman, who hath speech and understanding as you mortals have. I have brought thee hither to bind up his wounds, for no one of uh, let me try that again, for no other hand than thine can heal him. I have no skill in the art of healing, said the seal catcher, astonished the fur bodingness of these strange creatures whom he had so unwittingly wronged. But I will bind up the wound to the best of my power, and I am only sorry that it has my hands that caused it. Well, at least he's sorry, I guess. He went over to the bed and stopped. <sighs> he went over to the bed and stooping over the wounded merman, washed and dressed the heart as well as he could, and the touch of his hands appeared to work like magic, for no sooner had he finished than the wound seemed to deaden and die, leaving only the scar and the old seal sprang up as well as ever. Then there was great rejoice throughout the whole palace of the seals. They laughed, and they talked, and they embraced each other in their own strange way, crowding round their comrade and rubbing their noses against his, as if only to show him how delighted they were at his recovery. But all this while the seal catcher stood alone in a corner, with his mind filled with dark thoughts, for although he saw now that they had no intentions of killing him, he did not relish the prospect of spending the rest of his life in this guise of a seal, fathoms deep under the ocean. But presently, to his great joy, his guide approached him and said, now you are at liberty to return home to your wife and children. <sighs> Jesus is so long. I will take you to them, but only on one condition. And what is it? asked the seal catcher eagerly, overjoyed at the prospect of being restored safely to the upper world and to his family. That you will take a solemn oath never to wound a seal again. That Will I do right gladly? God, it's so backwards a speech. He replied, for although the promise meant giving up his means of livelihood, he felt that if only he regained his proper shape, he could always turn his hand to something else. So he took the requited oath with all due solemnity, holding up his pen as he swore, and all the other seals crowded round him as witnesses and a sigh of relief went through the halls when the words were spoken, for he was the most noted seal catcher in the north. God, it's not done yet. Then he bade the strange company farewell, and, accompanied by his guide, passed once more through the outer doors of coral, and up and up and up through the shadowy green water until it began to grow lighter and lighter and at last they emerged into the sunshine of earth then with one spring they reached the top of the cliff where the great black horse was waiting for them quietly nibbling the green turf when they left the water their strange disguise dropped from them and they were now as they had been before a plain seal catcher and a tall, well-dressed gentleman in riding gloves. Get up behind me, said the latter, as he swung himself into his saddle. The seal catcher did as he was bid, taking tight hold of his companion's coat, for he remembered how nearly he had fallen off on his previous journey. Then it all happened as it happened before. 
The bridle was shaken, and the horse galloped off, and it was not long before the seal catcher found himself standing in safety before his own garden gate. He held out his hand to say goodbye, but as he did so, the stranger pulled out a huge bag of gold and placed it in it. Thou hast done thy part of the bargain. We must do ours, he said. Men shall never say that we took away an honest man's work without making reparation for it, and here is what will keep thee in comfort to thy life's end. Then he vanished, and when the astonished seal catcher carried the bag into the cottage and turned the gold out on the table, he found that what the stranger had said was true, and that he would be a rich man for the remainder of his days. Huh. Well, that story wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Well, I'm not tired yet, so maybe it wouldn't be so bad to maybe have another one. Not that I really care if you mind or anything. Well, I'm glad that you like the idea. Well, since it's on the next page, how about the page boy in the silver goblet? Good. Fine. Not that I care if you care. Alright. The page boy in the silver goblet. There was once a little page boy who was in service in a stately castle. He was a very good-natured little fellow, and did his duty so willingly and well that everybody liked him, from the great earl, who he served every day on bended knee, to the fat old butler, whose errands he ran. Huh, sounds like me. Now, the castle stood on the edge of a cliff, overlooking the sea, and although the walls at the side were very thick, in them there was a little postern door which opened onto a narrow flight of steps that led down the face of the cliff to the seashore, so that anyone who liked could go down there in the pleasant summer mornings and bathe in the shimmering sea. On the other side of the castle were guard- Let me try that again. On the other side of the castle were gardens and pleasure grounds, opening onto a long stretch of heather-covered moorland, which at last met a distant range of hills. Sounds like he's got it pretty good. The little page boy was very fond of going out on this moor when his work was done, for then he could run about as much as he liked, chasing bumblebees and chasing butterflies, and looking for birds' nests when it was nesting time for spiders. And the old butler was very- The old man always gave him one warning. Now mind my words, laddie, and keep far away from the fairy known, for the little folk are not to trust to. Huh. This known of which he spoke was a little green hillock, which stood on the moor not twenty yards from the garden gate and folk said that it was the abode of fairies who would punish any rash mortal who came too near them. And because of this, the country people would walk a good half mile out of their way even in broad daylight, rather than run the risk of going too near the fairy known and banging down the little folk's displeasure upon them. Well, this sounds more like a mango now. And at night they would hardly cross the moor at all, for everyone knows that fairies come abroad in the darkness, and the door of their dwelling stands open, so that any luckless mortal who does not take care may find himself inside. Now, the little page boy was an adventurous white, and instead of being frightened of the fairies, he was very anxious to see them, and to visit their abode just to find out what it was like. So one night, when everyone else was asleep, he crept out of the castle by the little postern door, and stole down the stone steps, and along the seashore, and up onto the moor, and went straight to the fairy known. To his delight, he found that what everyone said was true. The top of the known was tipped up, and from the opening that was thus made, rays of light came streaming out. His heart was beating fast with excitement, 
but gathering his courage, he stooped down and slipped inside the known. He found himself in a large room, lit by numberless tiny candles, and there, seated round a polished table, were scores of the tiny folk, fairies and elves, and gnomes dressed in green and yellow and pink, blue and lilac and scarlet, and all the colors, in fact, that you can think of. Oh, huh, this, this is really getting interesting. Don't look at me like that. D shut up. He stood in the dark corner, watching the busy scene in wonder, thinking how strange it was that there should be such a number of these tiny beings living their own lives, all known to man, at such a little distance from them, when suddenly someone, he could not tell who it was, gave an order. Fetch the cup, cried the owner of an unknown voice, and instantly two little fairy pages, dressed all in scarlet livery, darted from the table to a tiny cupboard in the rock and returned staggering under the weight of a most beautiful silver cup, richly emboised and lined inside with gold. He placed it in the middle of the table, and aimed clapping of his hands and shouts of joy. All the fairies began to drink out of it in turn, and the page could see from where he stood that no one poured wine into it, and yet it was always full, and that the wine that was in it was not always the same kind, but each fairy, when he grasped, uh, let me try again, when he grasped its stem, wished for the wine that he loved best, and lo, in a moment, the cup was full of it. "'Twould be a fine thing if I could take that cup home with me, thought the page. No one will believe that I have been here except I have done something to show it. So he bided his time and watched. Presently the fairies noticed him. And instead of being angry at his boldness and in, in, in entering their abode, as he expected they would be, they seemed very pleased to see him, and invited him to a seat at the... table. But by and by they grew rude and insolent, and jeered at him for being content to serve mere mortals, telling them that they saw everything that went on at the castle, and making fun of the old butler whom the page loved with all his heart, and they laughed at the food he ate, saying that it was only fit for animals, and when any fresh dainty was set on the table by the scarlet-clad pages, they would push the dishes across to him, saying, Taste it! for you will not have the chance of tasting such things at the castle. At last he could stand their teasing remarks no longer. Besides, he knew that if he wanted to secure the cup, he must lose no time in doing so. So he suddenly stood up and grasped the stem of it tightly in his hand. I'll drink to you all in water, he cried, and instantly the ruby wine was turned to clear cold water. He raised the cup to his lips, but he did not drink from it. With sudden jerk, he threw the water over the candles, and instantly the room was in darkness. Then, clasping the precious cup tightly to his arms, he sprang to the opening of the known, through which he could see the stars glimmering clearly. He was just in time, for it fell to a... Uh, I'll try again. He was just in time, for it fell to with a crash behind him, and soon he was speeding along the wet dew grass with the whole troop of fairies at his heels. They were wild with rage, and from the shrill shouts of fury when the other, the page, knew well that if they overtook him, he need expect no mercy at their hands. And his heart began to sink, for fleet of foot, though he was, he was no match for the fairy folk who gained on him steadily. All seemed lost when a mysterious voice sounded out of the darkness. Thou whilst gain the castle door, keep the black stones on the shore. It was the voice of some poor mortal who, for some reason or another, had been taken prisoner by the fairies, who were really very malicious little folk, and who did not want a little fate to befall the adventurous page boy. But the little fellow did not know this. He'd had. Ugh, God. Ugh. Let me try again. 
He had once heard that if anyone walked on the wet sand where the waves had come over them, the fairies could not touch him, and this mysterious sentence brought the saying into his mind. So he turned and dashed panting down to the shore. His feet sank in the dry sand, his breath came in little gasps, and he felt as if he must give up the struggle. But he persevered, and at last, just as the Four most fairies were about to lay hands on him, he jumped across the water mark onto the firm wet sand, from which the waves had just receded, and then he knew that he was safe, for the little folk could no, could no step further, but stood on the dry sand uttering cries of rage and disappointment. While the term while the triumphant page boy ran safely along the shore, his precious cup in his arms, and climbed lightly up the steps in the rock and disappeared from the postern. And for many years after, long after the little page boy had grown up and become a stately butler, who trained other little page boys to follow in his footsteps, the beautiful cup remained in the castle as a witness of his adventure. Huh. Well, that was a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. Don't tell Yuri, okay? Hey, did I bore you? Maybe you're just tired or something. You better have been just tired or something. But you are pretty warm. Well, I guess I'm a little tired, but I want to keep reading. But I'll do it to myself. I don't want to wake you up. I guess this was fun or whatever. You better sleep well. You better tell me how my reading was in the morning. If you don't wake up before then. Good night or whatever. In bygone days, long centuries ago, there lived a little queen had three daughters, and the little queen was so poor, and grown up.